Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamer's Edge podcast. With Nicholas, I write video games articles for DreamersEdge.com. And I'm Dimitri, webmaster of the DreamersEdge.com and movie critic and television critic this month. Uh, we're concluding our big month of uh, television exploration. Next week we'll go back to movies with, of course, uh, you know, the uh, remainder of the television grid for the season. Yeah. But first we're going to do something uh, we like to call... Show and tell, and that's when we make a few recommendations, so these will be our last uh, recommendations for television for a little while. Uh, why don't you get us started? Well, I recommend a cartoon called Futurama. Uh, it started early in the 90s and then got cancelled because Fox doesn't know talent and good shows. And because of high DVD sales and its popularity on Cartoon Network, it uh, got a comeback and now it's playing uh, every week on Cartoon Network, so I recommend that. Yeah, it's a good show. Uh, a lot of people have complained that upon their return, they were very different. Uh, and a lot of people say it's kind of lame in comparison. But uh, I I haven't caught this season, but I caught last season. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's actually pretty similar. I mean, there's a little bit more heavy-headed satire than pr- before, but overall, yeah. it's the same. I, I did find it was different, like last season. But this season, I think they came back to what they were. And it, it, it is as good as it was before it got cancelled. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm wondering maybe if it's the same case that happened with Futurama, where it's a case of maybe, you know, the writers getting back into that headspace and taking some time, or maybe training new writers, maybe. Yeah, it's probably what happened. I don't think you mean something else than Futurama when you said that it's the same thing as in Futurama. Wow, uh, I meant family, <laughs> guys. Sorry, guys. Yes. Uh, my recommendation is something that uh, uh, plays on Sundays, which we won't get a chance to talk about because it's not on one of the major networks. It's on AMC, and that's The Walking Dead. Uh, the Walking Dead is a uh, zombie show, and it's actually a very good zombie show. It's okay. based on the comic book series. All right. It's a very human take on it. The, the survivors have very human reaction. It's very much about the, the human nature once you strip down civilization and everybody turns into zombies. Okay. Very good. Playing on AMC. We reviewed the first season here on the DreamersEdge.com, and we will review the second season as well when it comes out on October. So that's on AMC at 10 p.m., and... If you're a fan of the show, be sure to come to the site and check out our reviews. Just as general interest question, what kind of zombies are they? Like the slow, dumb kind or different kind? Like other movies try to portray them? They are the slow zombies. Good. Those are the slow zombies I like. I agree with you. I prefer the slow ones. Yeah, they're scarier. You know, you, you, you still think you have a hope of getting away, but you know that if they catch you, you're, you're doomed. So I think that they, they're better for suspense. Yeah, that's an excellent point, because you see them coming. You can actually be have time to be afraid instead of always relying on the jump scare where they come out of nowhere and bite you already. Yeah. All right, so that's it uh, for our recommendations. And uh, I guess we're going to move on to the Saturday schedule. So what's ahead on Saturday night on television? Football. Football. Let's move on to Sunday. All right. Sunday at 8 o'clock on ABC. It's... Uh, once Upon a Time. A show where uh, fairy tales and reality come together. I'm having deja vu. Yeah, wasn't there a show like that on Another Network on Friday? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I distinctly remember Grimm being on Fridays. Yes. Well, Grimm, it was about a detective that probably yeah, solves crimes. She's a Bales Bonds woman. But it's about her life being affected by yeah. her realizing that she's probably the daughter of fairy tale characters. Probably going to be very different. Mm. Not something that that quite speaks to me. That I'm going to watch, um, so I'm probably going to pass on that. It appeals to me a bit more. I think it has magic and stuff, and it it is it it is uh, from the same creative team that brought us Lost. I think Adam Arhowitz is one of the executive producers. Okay, I never watched one single episode. Really, you managed yeah. to avoid that? Yep. Too much investment, eh? Yes. I- I'm going to miss some episodes sometimes and I need to be able to jump back in without you know, realizing, hey, who are these three new characters and wasn't this guy in this episode? <laughs> and like, I don't like that. Let's digress about that, shall we? I feel that this recent trend towards heavy serialization in series where, you know, TV shows are one big story that has to be planned out from the beginning with a set ending and... Fans always get very angry. It's like, oh, well, they're clearly just making it up as they go along. Um, I understand where it comes from in the sense that, you know, if you're going to start big conspiracies, it is reassuring as a viewer to believe that the writers actually are headed somewhere planned. Okay. 
But I don't like it for exactly the reason you mentioned. I, it means that I have to commit to the television show. And, you know, sometimes life gets in the way and yeah. I don't really want... Even with TiVo, you know, a couple of weeks you're too busy so you, can, you cut down on TV to do other stuff and all of a sudden you have so much catching up to do because, you know, your TiVo's full and do I have to watch this, this and this and it, it's, you know, TV is not my life. TV is a pastime for me. Exactly. That's a very good point. Uh, anyway, let's move on, I guess, to um, 9 o'clock, still on ABC, we've got Desperate Housewives, season 8. And the last season, I think. Yes, you're right. Did not catch any of the first sevens. I'm not going to start now. It's just not a premise that really interested me. Well, yeah, it's a soap opera. That's really not your kind of thing. Yeah. Um, what's weird about it is that it actually started out as a satire of a soap opera. I watched the first season, enjoyed it tremendously. I thought it was very, very funny and witty. But what it is, is was really the writers taking the piss out of all that soap opera formula. Okay. And um, what happened is that, you know, they got renewed, they got super successful, and they had to continue. And so the show just sort of became a soap opera with a little bit of a, you know, witty edge to it. But it was still essentially a soap opera at that point. Okay. Sort of what happened with Dawson's Creek, where he was taking the mickey out of the teen drama and then just became a teen drama yeah uh desperate housewives same phenomenon went on for eight season it's the final season i think it's a good idea to end it now yeah i will confess i i stopped after season one okay but every time i catch a rerun every one now and then when i'm working on something and i have the tv on and every time it hooks me every time i'm like oh What's going on there? And then I stop working and I watch till the end of the episode and I go like, oh, I got to catch uh, the reruns for next week because I want to know what happens next. And then I forget about it. Yeah. That's what the soap opera does. You know, it, it reels you in. It has to. So, you, you know, what's going to happen next? Anyway, I guess we might as well move on. Indeed. <laughs> to uh, Pan Am at 10 o'clock, still on ABC. Yeah. A, a show about stewardess. Stewardesses. Yeah. And I'm happy you use the word stewardess and not a uh, flight attendant because... Uh, that's one of my pet peeves whenever people um, use the word flight attendant to uh, to refer to Pan Am or any stewardess from the 50s and, well, in this case, 60s, I think. I guess. Pan Am was during the 60s, right? It's, an, it's a real airline, for those of you who don't know. It used to be a real, real airline. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it got shut down a long time ago. In the 80s, I think. Well, that's a long time ago. That's like 30 years ago. Shut up. I'm uh, not old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, they, when they were hired, there were stewardesses. Because what happened is that in the airlines, only men were allowed to work on a plane. Women were not allowed to work, period, in general, but certainly not on a plane. Yeah. World War II uh, happened, and there were not enough men to mend the planes. So they had to women the planes. Exactly. They had to women the planes. And that's when women came in in the 40s uh, in, in the airlines for the first time. And since men who uh, were, you know, attendants in a plane were called stewards, the women were called stewardesses, which is the feminine of steward. I don't know when people decided that stewardess was an offensive term for female flight attendants, like, oh, you're trying to demean me. No, stewardess is the feminine of steward. That's what they're called. Yeah. But anyway, I think Pan Am was one of the airlines in question, but a number of airlines decided that uh, that's how they were going to make uh, a fortune, by selling flight as sexy okay and the stewardess became a uh, sex symbol as a result they really advertised the crap out of it you know go to our planes and have a sexy experience with our stewardesses in our planes what were people expecting the stewardess to do i believe that it was around that time that the mile high club was <laughs> created yeah sure those restrooms are cramped okay I do it solo, solo aviator edition, but I mean, if you do a couple of people in there, that's hard. Um, uh, all that to say, though, that that's what Pan Am is going to be about. It's totally a, a knockoff of Mad Men in the sense of like, oh, let's do a period piece that's going to deal with gender roles. Okay. Uh, Mad Men being the show on AMC about uh, men in the fashion industry. So you think it's going to be the same thing, just a period piece exploring stewardess in that time? I think so, although uh, when we read the synopsis for this, they mentioned espionage. Again. Yeah, and also it's in the publicity on TV. You Is know, it? Cause they have, they have, one guy just mentions an off-put line that they have access, they can go anywhere around the world and not, you know, be, they're not, you know, getting looked at because it's their job. So it's the perfect, you know, excuse to travel and be, you know, going to espionage. So there might be a little bit of that as well. 
maybe one of them is, is a spy and you discover it somehow at the end or something. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that might be one of those things where one of the characters gets roped into working for the CIA or yeah. something. But um, if, if that doesn't happen, I, I'm honestly a show about flight stewardess, flight attendants, whatever. Not very interested about the women that serves me peanuts and coke in my flights. I don't consider that glamorous. It's a job. It's fine. It's not a great glamorous job and not something I'm interested in watching, really. I mean, I don't mind that because, again, it might play on the gender roles and might play on how different it was for a woman working in a any work environment back then as opposed to now and yeah. certainly air travel has changed in Indeed. the last few uh, years but the flip side of that for me is that it is a cast uh, where you'll have three or four uh, people that are going to return every week but everyone else in terms of guest stars and whatever is going to be a passenger and therefore are going to show up for just one week yeah and that runs the risk of turning into the love boat real quick you didn't like the love boat? I did not love the love boat. Okay. Uh, I watched it as a kid <laughs> uh, in reruns in yeah. French. Indeed. And no, it did not attract me. Okay. In, like even the more recent versions of that, like there's a, there was a show not too long ago called uh, Las Vegas. Yeah. And it suffered from the same problem. That was about casinos in Las Vegas. And yeah. what happened is that the guests, you know, there were no recurring guests really. So... Every week they meet new people, bringing new problems, and every week they would deal with that, and then they'd disappear, and you'd be like, "What else?" I know, that's a good point. I did not think of it that way. There were a few interactions between the cast, but it was mostly dealing with their problems. Yeah, it, it got old really fast. All right, then good time to move to CBS. All right, winding back time. CBS at eight o'clock. A show you like? The show I love. <laughs> it's the Amazing Race. Yes. It's the best show of the week. It's basically a race around the world. They have legs of each race. They have to not end last of that leg. Every the team that ends up last gets limited. And they have like, you know, roadblocks and, you know, certain tasks to do during the whole travel. It's just fun to see them, you know, see the world, see different cultures, see what they do. It's really, they, they show the good part of traveling pretty much. And they hide the bad part. I agree. And, and they show adventures traveling, which is my favorite part of traveling. Yeah, I am not one of those travelers who go to a place and then sit at the hotel all week or at the beach. And what's the point? I agree. I, I want to experiment as much as possible. I mean, I enjoy the beach. Say you go to Hawaii, you might save like an afternoon for the beach or so. But, you know, if not, you, you want to explore the island and see, what, see what's there to see. And that's what they do. They had the, With the roadblocks and the, the uh, tasks they have to do, they get to see a lot of it. A lot of the countries they visit and... It's really fun. There's two types of roadblocks. There's one that I like more than the other. I like the roadblocks when they force them to uh, partake in a, a folkloric or cultural activity. Yeah. You know, like when you have to start, like they were in, I think, in China, and they had to start making those uh, art pieces with sand and, and with the plates. That was really cool because I, I want to do that. You know yeah. what I mean? But the ones where they have to eat like uh, 10 pounds of caviar or whatever, I'm like, eh. Some of them are fun. Like the 10 pounds of the caviar, it was funny because nobody was ready for to eat the caviar. They didn't know what caviar tasted like for most of them. So they were not ready for the saltiness. And so many teams could not take it. And that was funny. Yeah. The, the, one, the, the one I didn't like is like in Africa, eating a whole ostrich egg in Africa mm -hmm. when you had like kids from the village and that probably represented like a week's worth of food for them. And they came to see the Americans eat like this enormous quantity of food just for the kick of it, you know, for a TV show. Um, that did not really sit well with me that season. That's a little bit sick. The, yeah. the only way they should be allowed to get away with that is if the producers of the show then uh, agree to feed the village for a month. Yeah. My favorite uh, contestants, though, has to be the ones that are there for the travel and don't actually care that much. Oh, yeah. They, they're, they're just sightseeing. and Other teams are running past them and they're just sightseeing and looking. Oh, look at this. This is cool. and This is awesome. And they go shopping. <laughs> a year they had a team of hippie. And the hippies decided, yeah, we're, we're going to pick up a hitchhiker because, you know, we hitchhike in, in the United States. And I think it, it's the fun thing to do. So they had to catch a flight. But, you know, we're going to pick up a hitchhiker. And they went to a convenience store with him. And they bought stuff. And they, they spent time together. And they 
they keep their flight by like a few minutes. They almost <laughs> missed it, but no, they just wanted to pick up Hitchhiker because that, that's what they do. They ended up winning the Amazing Race. <laughs> oh, no kidding. That is awesome. <laughs> yes. Hey, man, it's karma. <laughs> I guess so. All right, at 9 o'clock, we got The Good Wife, Season 3. I saw... Half an episode of that, because by mistake, pretty much. Yeah, no, I, I don't watch it either. I have caught a few episodes, and the truth of, of it is, it's better than I expected it would be. I like the main character, though. She has that angry look all the time with her eyebrows. It really bothered me for the half episode I watched. She, the, the, the perma angry look on her. I'm like, cheer up, come on. <laughs> I know it's the actress that looks like it's not her fault. It's just, it was really off playing. I was like, why is she angry all the time? <laughs> well, maybe she's angry because she ended up with a dud of a husband instead of Dr. Doug Ross. I guess so. Anywho, uh, 10 o'clock, we got CSI Miami Season 10. Can't believe they moved that on Sunday. You really that shocked you? Yeah. Why? I know Sunday is a, is a normal day because, you know, people watch TV because they work on Monday. Sunday does, does, like, does not seem like the more important day of the week for ratings. And I think CSI would still makes good numbers, so I'm really shocked that they, they're trying to win Sundays. Uh, maybe, you know, after 10 seasons, uh, CSI Miami maybe is getting a bit tired, maybe? That's true. I mean, because let's face it, every episode is the same with David Caruso just doing his thing. Yeah, that's true. It's so hard to talk about CSI Miami, I find. Uh, the reason for that is that all the show is is... David Caruso doing his crazy mannerisms. Yeah. But he's been doing it for 10 years and they're hilarious. So everybody's already made fun of them. Indeed. So I'm sitting here at this podcast going like, okay, we got to talk about CSI Miami. What can I say? And all those jokes about David Caruso are coming up and it's like, they've all been done before. Is there another cast beside him? <laughs> other people on the show? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And they're actually... The, they're good looking and they look charismatic enough, but uh, I can't remember them because it's all about David Caruso. Yeah. Although women love the Caruso. Really? Yeah. Uh, mothers in particular love the Caruso. I think, well, it's probably the age range, but yeah, they love it. And, although, and he plays to that. You know, he's a character who loves children. And he's going to save children. Yeah, that's true. And uh, he's sexy and a little bit non committed, so he could go with you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And he's tough on crime. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, yeah right. I think I would be uncomfortable watching uh, CSI Miami uh, with my spouse if I had to. Because I know that in her mind, she'd be having sex. And I'm sitting right there next to her, not partaking in it. You'd get lucky later on in that evening because she's, you know, so that would be a plus for you. Yeah, but it wouldn't be really with me emotionally. So I'd feel like a cheap whore afterwards. <laughs> you'd, you'd just be happy you'd be getting nookie, okay? So if you're married, normally you don't get any. And now you'd get some that on that evening. <laughs> that is a good point. <laughs> New plan. All right, NBC, obviously, uh, Saturday had college football. So NBC on Sunday has Sunday night football. Yeah. Um, let's move on to Fox. Um, they start earlier. They start at 7.30 with The Cleveland Show reaching its third season. Yeah, but, you know, Cleveland character from Family Guy. So you've known him for longer. That's true. I did not catch the show because I was in Europe. Uh, I might give it a try. Uh, you tell me it's different from Family Guy a lot, so... I do. So more on that. Yeah, I was like, I was surprised. Like, I was going to jump in with that, and it was like, oh, you already said it. <laughs> it yeah. is very different from Family Guy. Uh, I actually do recommend it, because uh, my big problem with Seth MacFarlane's shows in general uh, is that they've tended to be very much the same. Yeah. And what's kind of cool with Cleveland is when they started, I was, I was like, really... I don't know, do I really need a second American dad? Except he's black, and he's going to be written by Jewish writers who are not black, and they're going to be making black jokes. That all sounds terrible to me. Yeah. Um, and, by the way, I didn't assume that his writers are Jewish just because he's in Hollywood. He, he actually openly mentions that the writers are Jewish several times, just so we're clear. Okay. Also, Holocaust bad. Mel Gibson bad. But... It turned out completely different because what it is is that uh, Cleveland is such a different character. He's he's not the loud mouth middle class dad that's an idiot like Homer Simpson or you know or Peter Griffin or American Dad whatever his name is. Stan, I think. Yes, Stan. Stan. He's just this sort of quiet pushover with like this big amount of resentment coming off slowly through, you know, sarcastic comments. He's a completely different character. Yeah. And that reorients the entire show into a different sort of joke. Okay. 
very funny stuff, but I'm a little bit worried about it because uh, it's at 7.30 right before uh, the NFL games. They did that to Futurama, uh, you know, 10 years ago or so. And that's what killed Futurama because, you know, half the time it was preempted, half the time it's, it ran late. No one could really, you know, grab hold of the show. That's true. And now they're going to do it to Cleveland Show. I'm wondering if they're not trying to kill it just a little bit. They should ju- They should do that to American Dad instead. Let's move on to 8 o'clock. And I'm sure everybody knows what's playing on Fox at 8 o'clock. Is The Simpsons reaching its 23rd season? Uh, I gave up on them on season 10. Eventually, it became the same thing over and over again. At the beginning, you know, it was about a family. And you had, like, episodes about every character or so. And every character had different problems. Now it's about, you know, Homer being loud and annoying and dumb and Bart being Bart. And that's about it. You know, Lisa and Marge, maybe they get an episode once in a while, but it, it's it's the Homer show and Bart has a sidekick. I get also annoyed by the laziness of the writers in the sense that they tend to just make things that don't entirely make sense. And then they have a character point out that it, it doesn't make sense or that they've done it before or whatever. And looking at the screen and just like shrugging, going, what are you going to do? And you're like, you do that once and you're like, eh, it's kind of clever. Yeah. It's a nice trick to regurgitate the same stuff and still get away with it. But it's still kind of clever. But they do that a lot. So at this point, it's just like, well, okay, now you're not even trying. Yeah. As long as Homer's loud, you know, that, that's all that matters, really. You used to love that show, man. Oh, yeah. I remember you and uh, one of our friends, which I, who I won't name, but we would wait online for movie tickets for whatever movies on Friday. Like any good teenager group, like any college group, I should say, any college group. Yeah. And there was a TV store right in front of the line for the movie tickets. And you guys would watch what's playing on TV and it would be either an episode of Seinfeld or a rerun of Simpson. And you guys could actually say what the dialogue was just from like watching the screen with no sound. Yes. And that used to exasperate you. <laughs> I, I, well, it, I was just sort of like, oh my God, I need to find cooler friends. <laughs> hey man, knowing the Simpsons is cool. I even found mistakes when they had the show on the Comedy Central, Beat the Geeks. Mm-hmm. I even found mistakes. And, with, you know, when they had the Simpsons Geek on, he gave wrong answers to questions. And I, I found, it, found them out. So, yeah, I used to know the Simpsons a lot. And the fact that you've completely given up on it, I think, is significant. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, 8.30, uh, a new cartoon that they're trying to sandwich in there, uh, like, every year. And it never works. Uh, I know. Alan Gregory. About uh, apparently the most pretentious seven-year-old on earth. That does not sound appealing to me at all. I actually think it could be funny. Because it's, it's the same concept that South Park has been using. The fact that kids can get away with a lot. Even animated. But, I mean, South Park was funny because the kids got a lot with, you know, they did stuff that was, you know, really, really crass. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of things you can do with that. Whereas this one, he's like pretentious in like eight years i don't know it, it kind of limits the premise i think kind of limits what he can do with where, where you can go with there i think it, it, it could be like uh like he could be the hipster version of cartman you know where he does and says these things that are just awful and obnoxious but you keep forgiving him because he's a kid doesn't know he doesn't know better okay i will say though from the uh the trailer is the animation does not excite me really yeah, it's sort of that Flash style that has become very popular. Oh, I hate that. Uh, Canadian viewers uh, will recognize it as uh, everything that's on freaking Teletoon. Indeed. Having said that, I will give Alan Gregory a chance just because I think the con- the the concept is kind of adorable. And actually, yeah, I've, I've watched the trailer and it made me laugh out loud. And that's a good enough reason to watch anything yeah, for me. Yeah, that's true. Moving on then at 9 o'clock with a season 10 of Family Guy. Yeah, another show canceled that came back, uh, thanks to DVD sales. Uh, I've been a big fan for all of its duration, and I'm going to watch it. I'm not going to miss that. Yeah, I actually gave it up uh, one year after their return, because I felt that the jokes were a little bit lame and repetitive. Okay. And then I caught it in reruns uh, recently enough and started watching it last year again, and I thought they were good. And I I think it is a, a case of just the writers needing training. Because, you know... You're off the air for a while. It's not like you have the writers on retainer. You know? Yeah, that's <laughs> you, true. You come back, you got to train new people. Yeah. 
So, yeah, no, I agree. It is funny again. Certainly funny than our next show. Indeed. Which is 9.30, American Dad reaching it, wait for it, seventh season. I can't believe that. that that's McFarlane, basically. That, that happened at the time when Family Guy was cancelled. So he basically did another pilot for Family Guy with different characters. You know, then it got accepted at the same time as Family Guy was coming back. So it was like, oh, I need, I need to tweak the characters around or else they're going to be exactly the same as Family Guy. But uh, it's, it's just very, very bad. But I don't necessarily completely agree with that. I think Stan is meant to be more the prototypical um, Republican. Well, not Republicans, conservatives, I should say. So is Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Family Guy makes fun of the middle class. Yeah, I guess. But American Dad is like, you know, straight on Bush voter is what they're trying to make fun of. And I'm not even fond of that joke. I, I'm mm. not fond of liberal pot shots, to be honest. And e even then, if you're liberal, if you're liberal and making fun of Republican, that's like shooting fish in a barrel, really. It's... I, I don't find it is. I find they're pot shots is the thing. Yeah. Like, I, I, I find there are pot shots that are based on making fun of this sort of straw man Republican. Yeah. And not actual Republicans. Like, I, yes, I realize that some of the figureheads give you the impression that a large portion of our Republicans might not be thinking everything they're saying through. Yeah. But that's not the picture of the average Republican. I know, reality. but that they're making fun of the, 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 the straw man Republican is what they're doing. And that is easy as, like oh. I said, it's super yeah. easy. Well, yeah, because it's a straw man. That's the point of a straw yeah. man. It's, it's easy to take down. But it, and for me, that makes it not funny. You know what I mean? It's sort of like you just built up this caricature that's so dumb that it's easy to make fun of. And you're like, ah, isn't it stupid? I was like, well, yeah, because you made it stupid. That's like if I said, if I told everybody that don't know you, that uh, you were a baby eater and you, know, you raped <laughs> dogs. And then I would like, isn't isn't Nick an awful person? Everybody's like, yeah, he is an awful person. It's like, ah, I proved my point. It's like, like yeah, you know. <laughs> That's a good point. But to me, it's it's just like the first few episodes. It was always like the conflict. It was always like conflict between him and his wife. Always conflict between him, him and his daughter, who's a hippie. And okay, fine, you have different ideology. You know, you're he's a Republican, you're a hippie. You don't have to fight all the time. Nonetheless, you can just give it a rest. You know, it's dinner time. You know, you don't have to bitch at each other. Oh, you're Republican, you're stupid. Well, you're a hippie, you're a hypocrite. I mean, I don't need to watch that all the time. I, I don't like conflict like that. It's not funny to me. Yeah, I, in fairness, I, I think it is a situation that happens a lot. You know, because, you know, that super hyper hippie liberal mindset often, you know, arrives when you're young in college, which is exactly his daughter's age. Yeah. And that super hard set it conservative mindset that they're trying to get at often happens when you're Stan's age. Yeah. So that situation happens a lot. I've been on many a table where I've been very uncomfortable with, you know, daughter and father duking it out on the political field and just sort of going like, uh, honey, can, can, can you stop fighting? It's I'm trying to make a good impression with your father. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I usually don't go back to, you know, eating at those places when that happens, you know, so I'm not going to watch this. <laughs> I mean, of course, me and my father had different ideas, you know, politically, but, you know, dinner time is, a, or, you know, anytime really, why would you just go and try and, you know, confront him with your ideas when you know he's not going to change his mind? Yeah, no, I mean, you bring it up an excellent point. And it is, I find something that is we're losing more and more, I think. That, that question of etiquette about, you know, not getting into fights about politics all the time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I include Facebook in that. Do not post your hardcore political comments as your Facebook status, please. Unfriend. <laughs> <laughs> it is so annoying. Because, like, here's the thing you have to understand about Facebook. Okay? I log in whenever. Everybody logs in whenever. They log in when they're in a good mood. They log in when they're in a bad mood. They log in when they're in a political mood. They log in when politics is the last thing they want to hear because they just got demoted at work and they just want to see how their friends are doing to have a little bit of a relief from that. Yeah. And then you go around going like, well, everybody who has this opinion about politics, which happens to be their opinion, yeah. is stupid and should be hung. 
Like, that's the last freaking thing he wants to hear. <laughs> and then you start a fight. And then he comments on the bottom and going like, well, you're stupid and you're a poo-poo head, you bleeding heart, blah, blah, blah. And then that gets transmitted to all of their hundreds of friends who then participate in that. And it just, like, snowballs into this big, gigantic, super Facebook message board of poop-faced political comments. And I log in, which I do about once a month, and see how my friends are doing. And all I'm seeing is these freaking posts of you're a poo-poo head. Well, you're a douchebagger. Well, you're a... Like, for six pages. And I have to press, like, next page, next page to get to a comment status that actually informs me on how my friends are doing. And since Facebook has just revamped their freaking page for the 19th time, I don't actually know where to click to get to the next page. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it freaking freezes my browser. The best one I saw was a discussion about do tax cut to the rich help the economy? And I'm not going to say if I believe it or not. That That's not part of the thing at all. Mm -hmm. But two people were arguing and it basically ended up with like at least 10 replies of yeah, uh, nah, -huh, yeah, -huh, nah, -huh, yeah. -huh. <laughs> they, they didn't add anything else. He was like, yes, they do. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they, just, no, they don't. Yes, they really do. No, they really don't. It's like, you're not, you're not you're discussing anything. You're just saying yes, no, yes, no. I mean, this was ridiculous. <laughs> oh, Facebook etiquette. <laughs> I know. So, very, going back to the subject, roundabout, those conflicts, those kinds of conflicts, not funny. So, that's why I'll watch American Dad. Fair enough. I, I think those conflicts actually can be funny if it's treated properly. If it's not treated about, like, let's solve the conflict and then, like, show how stands a moron. Yeah. You know, and instead laugh at the fact that these people are having these conflicts and making everybody else uncomfortable in the room. That could actually be very that funny. That could be funny, yes. Yeah. But, you know, O stands a moron, but he has a heart of gold, so it's fine. You know, like, oh, God. Yeah. And it's also, it's just cheap. Like, it's it's a family guy knockoff, as you pointed out, right yeah. from the onset. And that's the biggest turn off of it all. It's sort of like... First of all, Family Guy is funny, but I cannot watch more than one episode in a row, which is not a row at all, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you watched the movie, that was three episodes in a row. <laughs> yeah, I, I could not stand it. I got really tired really fast. It is better when it's separate, actually. Family Guy is like small doses. So one hour in a row of that, where like the second half hour is not as good as the first half hour, it's like, forget about that. Yep. So I guess that's it. Yeah. The next podcast that comes out is going to be all about the summer movies uh, roundup uh, with uh, Chris, Frank, and Eric joining us. Uh, that's what you can expect next week. And until then, I guess uh, we'll talk to you later. Goodbye. Goodbye.